texts can be classified into types according to what their overall purpose is. Different types of texts have different structural properties. The Australian curriculum divides texts into three main types, imaginative, informative, and persuasive. Within each of these broad types, we can find a number of different kinds of text. These subtypes of text are often known as genres. Imaginative texts are texts whose primary purpose is to entertain through their imaginative use of literary elements. They're created by their authors as works of imagination and normally do not claim to give accurate representations of real events. Imaginative texts include novels, traditional tales, poetry, stories, plays, fiction for young adults and children, including picture books, and multimodal texts such as film. Informative texts are texts whose primary purpose is to provide information. This includes explanations and descriptions of natural phenomena, recounts of events, instructions and directions, rules and laws, and news bulletins. You might find such texts, for example, in school textbooks, scientific journals, newspapers, print or digital, or instruction manuals. Persuasive texts are texts whose primary purpose is to put forward a point of view and persuade a reader, viewer or listener. This includes advertising, debates, arguments, discussions and influential essays or articles. Typically, different kinds of language are used in different text types and it's often easy to identify a type of text by the language used in it. For example, if a text begins with once upon a time, we know that it's a fairy tale that is a type of imaginative text. However, some text types may use language that is characteristic of another text type in order to achieve a particular effect. For example, it's quite common for persuasive texts, such as advertising, to use language which may be more characteristic of informative texts. This is one way of trying to achieve the effect of persuading, by presenting an argument as though it was a fact, and so hoping that the audience will accept it as a fact. Imaginative texts are often built up in a particular way which we call narrative structure. The New South Wales Board of Studies describes narrative structure as follows. First comes an orientation where the narrator sets the scene by describing the time, place and circumstances in which the story takes place and introduces the characters. The next stage is the complication, where a problem or complication is introduced which creates some sort of disturbance and leads to uncertainty about what might happen next. Often there is then a temporary resolution, where it seems as though the problem might be solved, but this is then followed by a reappearing complication, where it's revealed that the problem is not fully solved, or a new problem occurs that adds to the tension. Finally, there's a resolution where the problem is solved, and the narrator may reflect on the outcome and what has been learned from the events. If you think about books you've read or movies you've seen, it's not too hard to see that they tend to follow this general structure. The language used in imaginative texts typically includes a lot of descriptive detail to make the reader feel as though they're present in the story. This includes detailed descriptions of what something looks like, sounds like, smells like or feels like. Imaginative texts also typically use figurative language which is used to compare something to something else, again to create a vivid picture in the reader's mind. There are different types of comparisons. For example, simile makes the comparison explicit, as in she moved like a cat or the sun was like a ball of polished gold. In the simile, um, the comparison is made explicit by using words like like, it doesn't actually say that she was a cat or that the sun was a ball of gold, but that they resembled them in some way. A metaphor takes the comparison a step further by saying that the two things are actually the same. He is a walking dictionary. You are an angel. Hyperbole is another type of figurative language where a strong exaggeration is used to create a vivid impression. My bag weighed a ton. Of course it didn't actually weigh a ton or I wouldn't have been able to lift it. At the family Christmas dinner, there was enough food to feed an army. Well, probably not really. Informative texts typically employ what we call factual language. In an informative text, 
the intention of the writer is to present a set of facts or explain how something's done. But because there are many different subtypes of informative texts, there are obviously also differences in the language and structures found in an informative text. This depends on such factors as why the facts are being presented, the topic, the target audience, and so on. For example, a textbook for primary school children is going to need to use a different vocabulary and probably simpler sentence structures than a scientific paper, even if the topic is essentially the same. Compare the following texts. They're both about chemistry, but one is from a textbook, whereas the other is aimed at, aimed at chemists, that is, people are already very familiar with the subject. Carbon dioxide is an invisible gas with a sharp taste. It is fairly soluble in water. 200 cc of water will dissolve about 180 cc of gas at zero degrees Celsius. Carbon dioxide will not support the combustion of ordinary substance. Sodium, potassium and magnesium, however, will burn in the gas because the temperature of these substances when burning is sufficiently high to decompose the gas. The gas is heavier than air and in solution has an acid reaction, forming with water a weak acid, carbonic acid. The most characteristic property of the gas is its ability to turn lime water milky by the formation of a precipitate of chalk. Second text. The photolytic decomposition of phenyl azo -tri triphenyl methane in benzene apparently follows a similar course to the pyrolytic decomposition. It has been investigated by Horner and Naumann in 1954 and Hausgen and Nakata in 1954 and was found to involve a primary dissociation into phenyl and triphenyl methyl radicals and nitrogen in the manner indicated in equation 8. The phenyl radicals are capable of affecting arylation and the arylation is inhibited by the presence of an excess of p-benzoquinone, which traps the radicals efficiently. Nitric oxide similarly prevents the formation of triphenylmethane by uniting with triphenylmethyl radicals, as also does iodine in the presence of ethanol. You can see that the second text uses a lot more technical vocabulary than the first, while the first text explains things that experts would be expected to know, like what carbon dioxide is. The second text also uses a lot more passive clauses, has been investigated, was found to involve, is inhibited by, whereas the first text mostly has active clauses. It's also clear that the topic affects the type of language used. The terminology in the text we just looked at is specific to chemistry. A text about linguistics, for example, would use different vocabulary, as in this example. In paragraphs 3.2 and 4.4, we mentioned the Western Nilotic language Paddy, which is ergative and morphological marking and in constituent order, OVA, SV, in independent indicative clauses, although imperatives and some types of subordinate clause have the A marker extended also to cover S, affecting a nominative accusative system. Anderson 1988 states that in Eastern and Southern branches of Nilotic, there is nominative accusative case marking, generally expressed not by affixation but by tones. However, the accusative form is unmarked morphologically and is used in citation, making this appear to be a marked nominative system. A characteristic of many types of factual language, so, such as scientific and legal language, is the need to present information in a precise and unambiguous way. Look at the following, for example. A void marriage is one that will be regarded by every court in any case in which the existence of the marriage is an issue as never having taken place and can be so treated by both parties to it without the necess necessity of any decree annulling it. Avoidable marriage is one that will be regarded by every court as a valid subsisting marriage until a decree annulling it has been pronounced by a court of competent jurisdiction. This text is phrased in a particular way in order to eliminate any possible imprecision or possibilities for different interpretations. Everyone who reads it needs to come away with the same understanding of what the terms void marriage and voidable marriage mean. The need for precision is also to a large extent the reason for the use of technical vocabulary. Look at the following set of instructions. With a switch mechanism removed, the unit can be connected in accordance with the diagram shown on page 5. The four-way terminal block provides separate connections for the synchronous motor, but if this is not required, a light current link should be inserted between terminals 3 and 4, with a neutral taken to terminal 2, as shown as the, in the alternative wiring arrangement. The extended cable cover 
providing conduit entry is fitted by sliding it into the dovetails moulding on the case and extending the locking tab and securing it with the screw located inside the case. Without technical terminology, such text can actually be more difficult to understand and follow. The bit that the water comes out of has come out of the bit that the water passes through before passing into the bit that it should come out of, with the result that the water now comes out of the bit that it used to pass through on its way into the part that it should come out of instead of coming out of the bit it should come out of. This text would be a lot easier to understand if there were single words for the bit that the water comes out of and the bit that the water passes through before passing into the bit that it should come out of. In addition to the specialised vocabulary, we can see from these texts that there are certain types of grammatical structures that are characteristic of factual language, and especially of scientific language. The subjects of the clauses are nearly always non-human, inanimate objects, like carbon dioxide, the photolytic decomposition of phenyl azotriphenyl methane and benzene, the four-way terminal block, or even the bit that the water comes out of. They're also often very long and complex, as with the photolytic decomposition of phenyl azotriphenyl methane and benzene. As we've already seen, passive clauses are very frequent in scientific language. For example, it has been studied by Horner and Naum in 1954, or the arylation is inhibited by the presence of an excess of p-benzoquinone. We can see the same thing in, a te in the technical instructions. The unit can be connected are in accordance with the diagram, a light current link should be inserted between terminals 3 and 4. This is because the emphasis in these texts is not on who is doing it, indeed for the instructions the whole point is that anyone could do it by following the instructions, but on what is being done and what the outcome is. This is to do with the need for factual language to come across as objective, that is, not so much concerned with the actions or opinions of individuals, as with more general events, rules or processes. The aim of a persuasive text is to convince the reader or listener to adopt a particular point of view or to do something. Examples include advertising, propaganda, letters to editors, debates, court proceedings, job applications or personal references. The language used in a persuasive text is often different from the language used for presenting a set of facts. But it's not always necessarily so. For example, advertising can pose as factual text when it's actually aiming to persuade you to buy something. Research shows that this skin cream reduces wrinkles in 87% of women. The point of this is obviously to make you think that buying the product is a logical and rational thing to do. Often, however, the language used in persuasive texts is highly emotionally charged. It may use terms such as, for example, disaster or tragedy to convince the audience of the importance of the topic. It also typically uses terms aimed at getting the audience to agree with the speaker's point of view and disagree with the opposing view, such as clearly, it is obvious, this ridiculous idea, you're fooling yourself if you think, Typically, the opposing point of view will be described in negatively charged terms such as brutal or cowardly or pathetic, whereas the point of view that the speaker is trying to convince the audience of will be described in positively charged terms such as decent or humane or courageous. Generalizations are often used to focus on a particular aspect of a situation that the speaker wants to draw attention to and ignore any other details that might add nuance to an argument. For example, the term boat people is used to classify a large and diverse group of people by a single thing they have in common, namely trying to escape their home country and get to Australia by boat. This classification conveniently ignores any individual properties of the people involved, the fact that they have names, families, jobs and histories, and allows us to think of them as basically a problem that needs to be dealt with. The words that we use to label things or people are never neutral. Any time we label anyone or anything, we put them into a class, and that class can have positive or negative values associated with it. The label may be based on fact, but it may nevertheless have emotive force. Take the word drugs, for example. Is heroin a drug? Is marijuana? Aspirin? Alcohol? Nicotine? Steroids? Could you use a dictionary to decide which things belong and which don't? 
What other ways would there be to decide? Clearly, what we want to include in a particular class depends on what we're trying to achieve by that classification. Which of these substances is called a drug may differ from time to time and from person to person and from purpose to purpose. The classif classification is not inherent, it's imposed by the language user. It's clear from the brief outline we've given here that the study of text types is a large and complex area. A crucial point is that we cannot determine the full meaning of a text if we ignore what the writer or speaker has in mind. We have to determine the underlying purpose of the text, and this includes the audience that it's aimed at and the goal that the speaker or writer is trying to achieve through the text. <laughs>